And yet Ellen Hodgson Brown wants to retain interest. Okay. There was a third thing that troubled me, you know, when I went home from this high school class this one day. And that thing was, what about anything else? I have two categoric faults, which are easily identifiable and distinguishable from all other things. Inflation and deflation as the first, and the one I like to give last, that being inherent, irreversible, and therefore terminal multiplication of artificial indebtedness by interest. What about everything else? Well, I thought about all these things. And, you know, I, I come up with, you know, uh, one thing and another thing. And, and uh, after a while, as I explained in, you know, Patty Walking Turtle's interview, I suddenly realized there was a pattern to all these things. And the pattern hinged on this. The pattern of all other things that can go wrong with the economy stem from the only powers that this so-called central banking system imposes upon us. What are those only powers? They can manipulate upwardly or downwardly the volume of circulation from what it could be. Under mathematically perfected economy, it's always automatically correct without even any need for regulation. Why? Because anything that we need to represent by currency, we can borrow if we don't have the currency. Otherwise, we can spend it for it. And all of the currency in circulation automatically always equals the things it's supposed to represent because it's, all of it is paid out of circulation at the rate of consumption or depreciation of the related property. You see? So without even any regulation, mathematically perfected economy automatically regulates the volume to exactly what you determine it, it should be and must be. Whereas under this system, which has been imposed upon us, and uh, not a single uh, governing principle which serves us has ever been cited because none exist, it can only act to our inevitable destruction in a relatively brief cycle of terminal failure. The, the, the Federal Reserve System, after promising to solve the problems it can only cause to the Wilson administration, precipitated the first worldwide Great Depression a mere 15 years after it was put into existence in defiance of political promises to the contrary. That is, the Democrat Party platform explicitly promised not to create a central bank, and that's why Wilson was elected. Immediately, the very authors of the Aldrich bill that the Republicans had uh, proposed a central bank under are in the Wilson administration using all the terminology in all of the Aldrich bill to author, to rename it the Federal Reserve Act. It's just going to be a bank, folks. You can believe that forever. It's just a bank. All it does is publish our promissory obligations to each other, you know, and we're going to call it a bank because you're accustomed to banks and you kind of uh, tend to accept that idea even though you haven't the slightest idea what it really means and we're certainly not going to tell you, you know. So that's, that's how we got all this. Well, this third thing that was wrong with the economy then is, is, is all these upward and downward manipulations of the cost or value of money or property, you see, which are actually, while we consider though, can consider, and I do consider them to be sufficiently distinct uh, as, a, as a categoric fault from the other two categoric faults, inflation and deflation, and the last being inherent multiplication of artificial indebtedness into terminal debt. Um, it, nonetheless, this categoric fault then is comprised simply of either man, man, upward or downwardly m manipulating the cost or value of money or property. So this is how I come upon the three categoric faults of this lie of modern economy, which is an ancient ruse which has been imposed upon us, as we've said many times already, uh, without a single justifying principle. In fact, by undermining, subverting, corrupting 
every actual principle, the few actual principles that we should adhere to, which are that a promissory note is paid in full to the real creditor who demands no interest and is denied interest by this purported banking system, which obligates the debtor to pay the principal out of circulation at at least the rate of consumption or depreciation of the related property. That's it. That's the solution of our problem, and that is mathematically perfected economy. So those are the three categoric faults. <clears throat> so it took me some while after this day in this classroom to realize this pattern. It was a matter of months, you know, before I realized that, you know, that's it. We have three categoric faults. And the solution is, is simple and concrete and singular. There is one and one only solution only. Number one, we've explained why, how, how we've solved inflation and deflation by an obligatory schedule of payment of principal only. In other words, to solve inflation and deflation, likewise, you have to eradicate interest. We've solved the third category fault, inherent multiplication of artificial indebtedness by interest, by eradication of interest. And the third fault, systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property is solved by the combination of these other two solutions. How? In solving inflation and deflations, we've deprived the banking system or pretended economy of any power to man upward or mani downwardly manipulate the volume of circulation or the value of property because our obligatory schedule of payment and eradication of interest alone maintain a circulation which at all times is equal to the remaining value of represented wealth. So we have actually solved systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property by eliminating both of the powers to do, to do so, which are upward or downward manipulation of the volume of the circulation or uh, to impose cost upon us in the form of interest. So that's why there is one and one only solution to the categoric faults of this huge lie that we call economy. Now, in order to get our brains around current events as they affect us, uh, how are we going to go into, you know, court and defend ourselves uh, uh, singularly, individually, uh, against, uh, you know, foreclosure and, and things like that? Well, um, if you don't mind, I, I've given, you know, 40 years of, of, of extremely diligent, conclusive thought to these matters. And I long ago engineered a, a, a singular prescription for uh, actually proved a fact of a singular actual uh, prescription for transforming uh, usury into mathematically perfected economy. And uh, I've explained how to do this for, for, for many years. Um, uh, and although uh, no one wants to listen to anything rational on a Ron Paul forum, uh, elsewhere in the world, uh, uh, this idea has uh, long been received warmly without any uh, refutation. So as we understand this uh, issue of, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, inherent multiplication of artificial indebtedness, how does the failure eventually manifest? Well, it manifests because uh, overall our debts become our artificial debts, which aren't even owed to the banking system. They do represent obligations to pay original principal out of circulation, but that's what money really is. The rest of it's a lie. So, um, as, the, as this obligation exists to pay artificial obligation under a central banking system to pay interest and principal out of circulation against an ever escalating sum of debt which is perpetually multiplied in proportion to the circulation, thus eventually we get to this eventual sum of debt which the deflationary aspects of the circulation, that is the obligation to pay interest and principal out of circulation, eventually precipitate an inevitable failure. 
when we have borrowed so much that all that we can afford to service in the way of debt is, is consumed by existent debt, thus, inevitably, in the end of the life cycle, nullifying our creditworthiness to service any further debt. Banks can't loan us any more money. Our own evidence of our own debts to each other, if, we've, if they've already multiplied the artificial indebtedness to such a great extent that we, can, we cannot afford to service any further obfuscation of artificial indebtedness to them. So, in other words, we go to the bank needing more money, but no can do. So what happens is uh, next month we pay our principal and interest on all our debts, which is basically all the money that we have. And bingo, it's out of circulation, and we can't borrow it back. So the this the the end of this the natural end of this system comes in the way of practically immediate deflation of the circulation, which is why all of those people who don't service but who are pretending to service are scurrying around trying to find every possible way to bring more money back into circulation somehow. Okay? They're rescue they're trying to rescue a system which is unrescuable because it can only multiply debt indebtedness all the further. All the highways that they're restoring across the world now and all the things that they're doing are only accumulating further debt. And you know that. How do you know that? Even if they tell you otherwise, because your taxes aren't going up at all. So, all of these things actually contribute to failure. And should we service these te the, these, this further debt that we're assuming, we're over in you know half a heartbeat. It's a done deal. Your goose is already cooked, except you know we haven't put it on the table yet. And when it gets on the table, it's a cooked goose. You can do nothing with it. <clears throat> so, um, what do we do about this? Do we go to the judges? Do we go to the sheriffs? Do we go? Um, do we go to our representatives and uh, appeal to them yet again and then again and again uh, to deaf ears who never, never, never acknowledge? A fact of singular solution. If someone else can prove that there is, a, is, is an iota of deviation from what I have just prescribed is the only solution for the categoric faults of this huge lie of economy, come forward. Prove it. Demonstrate it to us. It can't happen. So now, why is it that these representatives uh, refuse to respond. Why is it Ron Paul will not either communicate with me and decide, well, you know, you're right. This is the only solution. This is the only thing that would have saved us. I am wrong in increasing interest rates. After all, during the Reagan uh, administration, we suffered the higher interest rates. He, 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 he's, he's, he's still advocating. We have a proven model of it. And what happened? Reagan increased the national debt of the United States, claiming that he was going to balance the federal budget. He increased the, the, the artificial indebtedness of the, uh, of the federal government more than any president before him. He tripled the national debt of the United States of America in seven years after denouncing uh, the $150 billion of federal debt that Jimmy Carter had accumulated over four years as unforgivable. He looked at Carter, he looked him dead in the eye, he gave him the evil stare down and pronounced the $150 billion that Carter accumulated in four years as unforgivable. Well, I had actually uh, uh, had a substantial amount of interaction with the Reagan campaign before that debate. They had already been presented a proposition of mathematically perfected economy that um, I actually I called the Reagan campaign as I have every president since and including Gerald Ford and most 
of the candidates. I've, you know, uh, uh, had substantial discussion with the Ross Perot campaign, um, uh, people in the Jerry Brown campaign against Bill Clinton wanted to adopt me as their monetary platform. I mean, I spoke into the wee hours of the morning 